And for me, I'll turn it over to Savannah to kick off today's presentation. Thank you. Hey guys, thank y'all for joining. I am always very excited to talk about interviews. I could talk about interviews for a long, long time. So if you need to cut me off, feel free. <laughs> I've, I've been known to keep going and going. So um, a little bit about me. I'm Savannah Perry. I am a dermatology PA in Georgia. I've been doing dermatology and working as a PA for the past 10 years. I work part-time clinically, and then I also do the PA platform, which is just helping you guys become PAs. So figuring out the best resources, answering questions. Uh, I know the process is confusing, overwhelming, all of the things. Uh, there's a lot involved, a lot of expectations for y'all. And so we try to make it as easy as possible. So with things like this, like webinars and, you know, just putting out all kinds of information. Um, this is for you. So if you guys were in our last webinar earlier in the summer, it really turned into a really great Q&A FAQ. Um, Y'all asked some amazing questions. So I want to make sure I get to as much of that as possible and giving y'all an overview of the interview process, things that you can expect going into interviews, things that you can be doing now to prepare. And then once you get that invite, what you need to be doing to make sure that you are ready. Oh gosh, Kayla says she has an interview tomorrow morning. Um, I'm stressed out for you, but it will be great. You will be fantastic. Uh, and we are in that interview season. So it is, you know, mid end of August, um, typically right now through September and October are when we are seeing the most interview invites, interviews going out. Um, this is the season. And then November and December, we can expect that it'll slow down a little bit. Um, January and February, we'll pick back up some a little bit in March. And then when we get to April, we're looking at the next season. Uh, that being said, there are still interviews that will go out in like end of April, May, even um, for a little anecdote, just to make people feel better. Um, a medical assistant who was working in my office for the past couple of years, she was on her third cycle of applying. Um, this past April, she received an interview invite and interviewed. It was a virtual interview. Two days later, they accepted her and she started PA school in May. Uh, so crazy stuff happens in this process. You really just have to be on your toes, be ready to go um, at any time. So you are already doing that by being here. And just don't be shy with your questions. Um, I'm going to pull them. I love that we're just like chatting and, you know, with each other in the chat. And so if you can put your questions in the q and I'll kind of pull from there as we go. And get some water breaks in there. Um, and then, um, and yeah, just thank you to Advanced eClinical for doing this. I love how much y'all support students. So from helping you guys get experience to preparing for this process and, you know, not leaving you hanging with like, what do we do next? Um, I, I really appreciate just, you know, their involvement with me and just making sure that we are helping y'all whatever way we can. So happy to be here. Okay. Uh, let's jump into the chat because I do want to make sure we are getting as much of those as we can. Um, and this is a, this is a great first question to start with. How is the best way to prepare for interviews? Uh, you know, some people may feel like I'm, I feel confident. <laughs> Most people maybe aren't going to feel like this, but I feel confident. Uh, maybe I don't really need to prepare. I'm just gonna, you know, walk in, do my thing. Uh, and if you take that approach, you may find after your first interview, you're kind of like, mm, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should prepare at least a little bit. Uh, and we don't necessarily want to over prepare. You don't want to become a robot in this process to where you are reciting answers or losing your personality, losing who you are, not being genuine. And so there is that fine line of preparing, but also, um, you know, being being real in your interview. So for preparing, there's a few things. The number one thing is practicing, practicing out loud. 
Uh, you can write your questions and answers down as much as you want forever and ever, um, but it's never going to be the same as saying them out loud. Um, and so if you uh, have somebody to practice with, or that's a family member, a friend, a PA that you shadow, somebody you work with, um, someone that you can sit down and practice with, they will be able to identify your habits a little bit better. Uh, when I was in college and applying to PA school, I went to UGA and there was this amazing PA that I shouted her name's Hope Cook. She actually has a PA podcast now and she worked in dermatology. And so I remember we went to practice when I got my interview invite. So she went with me to Chick-fil-A. We went to Chick-fil-A. Her kids were like playing the plaything. So it was not the best interview, quiet setting, but we sat down and she started asking me questions. And about halfway through, she said, do you know that after every question you say and stuff like that, which no, I did not. I didn't know that at all, but apparently I would answer. I would say, you know, I, I've loved my patient care experience as a CNA. I do enjoy working with patients, but I can't wait to be a PA and be able to diagnose and prescribe and stuff like that. And so I would have never noticed that myself. And she was like, if you have more to say, then say it, but otherwise you don't need to say that phrase. So the people that you practice with will really help with identifying those types of habits. I'm also a hair tucker. Like I tuck it behind my ears and she noticed that. If you have glasses, if you like adjust your glasses all the time, uh, clearly I talk with my hands, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you may want to keep it in check a little bit during the interview. Uh, so those things are important to identify with your practice ahead of time. If you don't have anyone to practice with, and even if you do video yourself, this is very uncomfortable. I understand that. I don't want to do it. I make YouTube videos and I don't watch them because I don't want to watch myself. I get it. But for an interview, it is important to, again, notice those habits, especially let's say you're doing a virtual interview, video yourself on Zoom, make sure your background looks good. Um, I'm in a brand new office, so mine is super boring. I don't have anything behind me yet, but make sure your, your environment is good. Make sure it sounds good. Um, video yourself answering some of those questions so that you can get a good feel for things. Um, I see that Kayla mentioned in the chat that she's been reading my interview guide um, and then she has some group and individual interviews. So we'll talk about group interviews. Um, but yeah, I have a book. It's called the PA school interview guide. Very creative title. Uh, it's on Amazon and I put a bunch of stuff in there, which is fantastic. I love that. If you've read my book, thank you, Sophia. Um, but you still need to practice like that alone is not enough. Like you still need to practice, please. Um, and it has a little mock interview guide in there too, that you can do. Um, but yeah, you just really, I mean, the more you can practice the better. Okay. Um, other ways to prepare, I think reviewing your application before your interview is really important and reviewing the schools that you are applying to. Uh, so to spend some time looking back at your application, just looking back at your classes. Um, I think for like one thing I see in mock interviews a lot is that people get zoned in on one thing. So they get zoned in on one experience. So let's say you did your ACT training, you got a great job as a medical assistant, and that's the only thing you talk about the entire interview. And you forget about the volunteer experiences you had or the other extracurriculars you have or the research. Um, so make sure you kind of talk about everything. Um, one thing that I talk about in the book is making a list of everything you want the school to know about you. So that can be personality traits, that can be strengths you have, goals you have, um, experiences you've had that have kind of shaped where you're at, um, anything that you want to kind of leave on the table. And I'm a pretty visual person. So in my mind, that's like a list, like a checklist that you have going into the interview. And as you talk about stuff, you just check it off. So, you know, I've talked about my mission trip to Jamaica, checked it off. I talked about working as a CNA at a rehab hospital, check it off. Um, I talked about volunteering with kids in Athens when I was at UGA, checked it off. Um, and so you're able to just give them as much as possible about yourself in the interview. Because uh, a lot of times you'll leave and you'll feel like, oh man, I didn't tell them anything. Or like, there was this really important thing that I wanted to tell them and you just completely forgot. And that's going to happen. Even if you have a list, even if you're prepared, it's going to happen. 
But if you can kind of start getting those things in mind while you're practicing, you will feel like you've left more at the interview when it's over. Um, and so that's the one thing I would say for people who said that they're interviewing like tomorrow or really soon, just know going into it, you will be nervous. That is normal to be nervous. Um, I like the idea of kind of taking hold of those nerves and turning them into confidence. Um, and just remembering that, you know, this is kind of in our mind, but they want you there. They would not have invited you for an interview if they did not want to get to know you, if they didn't want to know more about you as a person, if they didn't feel like you were a good fit for their program. If you are at the point where you have received an interview invite, that is a big deal. These schools are getting thousands of applications and they're only going to interview a small number of people for an even smaller number of spots. So it can be easy to feel discouraged by the rejections and the wait list and everything, but just know that getting an interview is such a big deal. So be proud of yourself. Um, and this is your chance to brag on yourself, which we also don't like to do. Bragging on yourself at the interview is so hard. We don't like to talk about ourselves and it feels really awkward, but this is the one chance you have to do it. Like you have to just get over that. Um, hype yourself up. Let the people who love you hype you up. And, you know, I know we get tired of our parents and friends and family saying like, oh, you're going to get in when they don't really understand this whole process. I understand it. Um, and I do feel like you're going to get in. But I also understand that feeling of I could have so much more. I could have better grades. I could have more experience. You could always have something more. But that doesn't mean that you're not already good enough. So I just want you to remember that going into your interview. Okay. Um, and if you're waiting, like that's also a terrible spot to be. It's so hard. This whole process is very nerve wracking with the waiting. Um, but just know, like, we never know when interviews are going to go out. Every school has a different timeline. Um, so don't feel too frustrated or stressed out if you haven't heard anything back yet. So that was a lot. That was a lot of answer to that question. All right. Ooh, okay. Another great question. Um, and I want to get into like some questions. So we'll do that. But should we take anything to our interview? For example, a cover letter, resume, et cetera. Is there anything we should have at the interview? Very common question. Um, number one, if they ask you to bring anything, make sure you bring that. Um, so the, you know, part of this process is paying attention to instructions. So if they email you and say, we want you to respond by this date, or we want you to bring this, um, you want to pay attention to those things and show that you're, you know, reading the details. And that's going to be an important factor as a student and as a PA that you continue to do. So look at the details. Um, for a cover letter or resume, you don't necessarily need anything unless you have something that's updated. If you have something dramatically different from when you applied and submitted your application as far as experience or jobs, uh, you could include that on a new resume and bring it in case you have an opportunity. Um, I know at my interviews, they would kind of pull you aside and ask, like, do you have anything you want us to update your file with? Is everything still current? Has anything changed? Um, and that was kind of your opportunity to say, like, I'm not doing that job anymore. I'm doing this job and make some um, adjustments there. Um, I brought a small bag with me. You don't necessarily have to. I would turn your phone off, like not silent, not airplane mode, like turn it off not on. Um, same thing with your watch. Like we just don't want any distractions, any possible, you know, phone going off at the wrong time, accidentally opening TikTok. If anyone's done that and something that should not start playing, starts playing. Um, definitely guilty of that one, you know, in the waiting room with other people around. So we want to try to minimize issues as much as possible. So everything on silent, um, a lot of times at an interview in person, they will give you a folder or paperwork, maybe a pen, like something about the program that you can kind of take notes on. Um, if you want to bring a padfolio or a notepad or something where you can take notes to, that's fine, um, but you may be provided with that also. Now that everything is online with CASPA, uh, you know, they can access your application, they can see everything, so you don't really have to bring that stuff. 
Um, at my interview, it used to be when they would actually still mail CASPA to the programs. And I got to one of them and they could not find my application, uh, which wasn't a huge deal, but they were just kind of like, where's your application? We don't know anything about you. Okay, like we'll just interview you anyway and we'll find it later, which was kind of weird. Uh, but um, yeah, so you you really don't have to take anything. If you do take a bag, I would keep it pretty small if possible. Um, okay, let's see. So we're getting into some kind of types of interviews. Let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, so somebody asked specifically about preparing for MMI and what to focus on, um, any new info not listed in your book. Uh, I think I put most stuff in there, but it is a little different to kind of explain it. So we'll go over that. Um, if you don't know what MMI is, it is called multiple mini interviews. So if we're talking about interview types, there's traditional, and that's just more of kind of question, answer, question, answer, kind of like a ping pong game. Um, it could be one-on-one -on -one with you and an interviewer. It could be two-on-one -on -one with two interviewers and you. Um, it could be a whole panel where you have four or five interviewers and you, but essentially they're just asking you questions and you're answering. And that may be a little bit conversational. They may build off of questions, but it's what you think of with an interview. Um, then we have MMI, which is station. So multiple mini interviews. And there are traditional MMIs, which mean that you go into the interview and usually you'll have seven to 10 stations. You start at a station and you have one to two minutes to review a prompt and then you go into the room or station and you have five to seven minutes to respond to that prompt. And then you leave and move on to the next station and they'll have bells or whatever to kind of cue you to move on. In a very traditional MMI, there are a couple of things that will happen. Your interviewer will not talk to you. So if you go in and you sit down and you're answering a prompt, uh, they're not going to ask you any follow-up questions. They're just going to let you talk. And then either when you're done, you'll be told to get up and leave the room or you and that interviewer will sit there and look at each other for the remainder of the time uh, without them talking to you. And with a traditional MMI, the goal is to look at different qualities. So they're looking for empathy and they're looking for um, communication skills, conflict resolution. So you can have things like role play where you have to walk in and pretend, you know, kind of do role play with a patient where you're a provider or some type of in some patient care experience setting and you are having to diffuse a situation or help them fill out paperwork or something to kind of show how you interact with patients. And then uh, you can have tasks like interpreting a graph or read an article and explain it. Um, someone mentioned that they have a timed essay on their interview, and that could be part of the stations too, where you um, are either given an article and asked a question about it or given a prompt to write a quick essay about it. Um, if you do have an essay at your interview, don't read too much into this. It is not the same caliber as your personal statement. Like they are not expecting a literary work. Um, and I had those in interviews and I kept it super basic, like fifth grade essay style intro with what I'm going to talk about, three body paragraphs and a conclusion. Um, made my points, made them clear and then moved on. Uh, so, you know, you, you don't have to do anything too crazy with that. If you want to prepare for that, take any of the interview questions you're practicing, set yourself a timer and just write out a response. Um, they may be handwritten, they might may be typed, we won't know till you get there. Uh, but MMI, the best way to prepare for MMI is to practice your traditional questions, but time yourself and really, really work on thinking out loud. Whereas in a traditional interview, you probably don't want to use five to seven minutes to answer a question. In an MMI, because it is a timed, like shorter station type thing, you do want to use that time as much as possible. Um, and I've done webinars specifically on MMI before. I think most of them are on YouTube because it could definitely be a webinar all on its own um, with just kind of showing, I think we've done some live 
MMI practice before, um, just kind of like talking through how to respond to those things. Um, Cause it does take some practice. And what I've found is most people after about a minute and a half to two and a half minutes, they're done with their answer. And that is not necessarily the best use of your time in an MMI interview setting. Um, when you have more that you could expand on, you could incorporate examples more and just kind of working through some of that. Now on the flip side, one thing about MMI interviews for PA school is some schools will say they do MMI, but they really just do traditional interviews in stations. So you get there and it's just really like a one-on-one -on -one traditional interview, but you move for, between stations. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you're not going to know exactly what kind of interview you're, work you're walking into. I think it is best to prepare for everything and anything and prepare for all different types of questions. We can have ethical questions, behavioral questions, situational questions, and those can be found at any type of interview. People have mentioned group interviews, and those also can be either a small group with a small panel, a small group with one interviewer, um, but it could be, you know, two people, applicants interviewing, three, four, five. It could be completely different depending on where you go. And then you may all be asked the same question. There are schools that ask applicants different questions. There are some schools that in a group setting will still ask you specific questions from your interview uh, or from your application. And so we don't really know how that works. In a group setting, my advice would be to be a little bit more cognizant of time. You don't wanna hog the whole time. So make your answers, answers a little more concise, a little more to the point so that other people have a chance. Know, who else, know other people's names. So learn the names of the people sitting with you uh, we're not in a vacuum. We're not by ourselves in a big part of the PA profession and PA education is working together. Um, you're going to be working very closely with your classmates as a PA. You're going to work closely with colleagues and coworkers, and they want to see that you can get along with others. Um, so if I'm, you know, sitting here and I have Mary and Joe beside me, um, I'm probably going to refer to them during the interview. Uh, I'm probably going to say like, oh, I love that, Mary, like, and then build off of her answer. Uh, if someone says the answer that you wanted to say in a group interview, <laughs> which can happen, um, have a backup, but also build off of it. Some of these answers, you're going to have shared experiences, but your example and your story and your experience will not be exactly the same as someone else's. Um, I think the example I use in the book is someone asking, you know, what's a challenge PAs face? And I think the first thing that a lot of us think about is how the general population may not always know what PAs are, and sometimes patients are confused. So if that was your answer, and someone says that, uh, no need to get flustered, no need to freak out and feel like you have to find something else. You can agree with them. You can say, oh, Joe, I completely agree. I also think that is the biggest struggle with the PA profession. When I was shadowing PA, I don't know her name, uh, Joey, Joe and Joey, that's not right, but um, Joey, um, I noticed that sometimes patients would be a little bit confused, but he did a great job of just explaining what a PA was and taking time with them uh, so that they felt comfortable with their care if he was the first PA they were ever seen. And they seemed really happy with that. Uh, and hopefully that will make them more aware of the PA profession and more willing to see PAs in the future. Uh, so you can build and, and pull in your own experiences. Um, sometimes a group setting will not just be an interview, but it'll be like an activity. So y'all will have to problem solve or build something together. Uh, and again, that's more about like the teamwork, kind of seeing how, how everybody works together. Uh, any other interview types? I think those are the main ones. And you can go to an interview and you can have all of these, all of them at the same time. All right. Okay, I want to get in and I see some questions about specific questions. Um, 
so I want to get into some of those. So like this one says, what are some of the most asked questions in a PA interview? Um, and so I think I clicked the button, right? Uh, so some of the most asked questions, the ones that you can prepare for are the ones that you would think of. So tell me about yourself. Why do you want to be a PA? Why do you want to go here? Why did you choose this school to apply to? Um, what is a PA? What does a PA do? What are your biggest strengths? What are your biggest weaknesses? How do you resolve conflict? Um, what are your goals as a PA? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, you know, those are the common questions. The thing you have to be ready for is being asked the common questions in different ways because they're not always asked just like that. So if you can prepare and have those things you want to talk about in mind, when you're asked a question in a different way, you can start thinking about identifying why are they asking me this? What do they want to know about me? Like for your biggest weakness, why are they asking about your biggest weakness? Why does it matter? Do they want to just, you know, know what you're not good at? Uh, no, probably not. They want to know if you are self-aware enough to realize your weaknesses and things you struggle with. And if you are doing work to do better at them, like what are you doing to fix it? Is it going to be a problem later on in PA school or as a PA? Is this something that, you know, could come up and, and be a red flag for them? Um, so, so thinking about those things with conflict or anything about academics, uh, do you know how to recognize when you're struggling academically and improve? One time I had a mock interview with someone and I asked, I said, tell me about a time you struggled academically. And I asked that because she had a fantastic GPA. Like, I think she had a 4.0 or like 3.99. Like, it was very, very good. And she said, I've never struggled academically. And to me, I was like, that is that comes across kind of as like a naive answer. Because even if you have a 4.0 and you have all A's, you have had difficulty with something. Like, some concept was more difficult for you. Uh, and I just, you know, not being able to identify that came across as, you know, will this person in this next level of education and this pace that we're about to be at, if they struggle, can they handle that if they've never struggled before? Uh, so those are things that are important to kind of talk on. I see a lot of people asking about biggest weakness. Um, Interviews is my biggest weakness. That's an interesting one. Uh, so it's not really about, to me, what your biggest weakness is. It's more about what you're doing to work on it and fix it. So the thing that I like to do in mock interviews with this question is I actually rarely ask, what is your biggest weakness? The question that I normally ask is, what would your coworker say is your biggest weakness? Or what would your family say is your biggest weakness? What would your friends say is your biggest weakness? Something that kind of makes you like think about it from a different angle because it might make you a little bit more honest with yourself. Because if you ask me what my biggest weakness is, I may try to glamorize it a little bit. But if I have to be honest and think about, you know, what are the things that my coworkers or friends and family are telling me I need to work on? I might be, my answer might change a little bit from that. And so that's just another way to think about it. Uh, and then, you know, I talk about in the PA school interview guide more, but I talk about making your answer full circle. So being able to state what it is, like answer the prompt, and then from there show how that, like what you're doing to fix it, how you're improving and then how does that relate to PA school or you being a PA and just kind of bringing that all around full circle. Um, sometimes I'll notice in mock interviews that people will kind of just state like, oh, my biggest weakness is interviewing. I get really anxious and it's hard for me. And that's it. Like that's where they leave it. Um, so being able to say, you know, because of that, I decided to attend some webinars about 
um, interviews and try to make myself more comfortable. I'm working with my friends and family members to try to get more comfortable with it. Like I know that in the future, I'm going to have to interview for jobs and, and with other people. And that's something I want to get better at. Like showing that improvement is important. Um, okay. It's another one here. Okay. What's the best way to go about the prompt? Tell me about yourself. Should we go... Should it be more personal life or more professional experience? I know we're told not to repeat anything already in our application. Who told you that? I like actually, I really actually want to know. Um, so I do not agree that you should not repeat anything on your application, and I will explain why. You cannot assume in this process anything, but you cannot assume that the person who is interviewing you reviewed your application. You cannot assume they've read it, that they've looked at it, that they even have it available. They might, but in some cases, schools will give just kind of like a little summary about who you are, or they'll give nothing. Uh, and these applications, if you've downloaded them from CASPA, they are 25, 30, 35 pages long. No one is going to have the time on your interview day to sit there and go back through your whole application. They're just not going to. Um, and a lot of the stuff just kind of starts running together. Uh, and it's very different coming from you versus reading it. So please don't feel like you can't talk about stuff that's in your application. Like what else are you gonna talk about? That's everything about you. Um, so yes, you can talk about stuff on your application and I would, and I would expand on it. But for tell me about yourself, I think about this question, I. I think this is in the book, it might be in the interview course, I don't remember, but um, I think of this question as like a speed dating question. If you've ever heard of speed dating, it's where you like go to little tables and you sit with somebody for a few minutes and talk about yourself. Um, I've never done this. I've just seen it on TV, but that's how I think about this. Like you're meeting someone for this very short amount of time and you're just like telling them about you. Um, so what would you tell them? You know, you're going to tell them a little bit of personal stuff, like where are you from? What's your background? And then you're going to get into some professional stuff too. What's your educational background? What's your, um, what's your experience? Like, what are you, like, are you certified in anything? That kind of stuff. Are you working now? What are your interests? Uh, and these things, you know, it should be pretty concise and straightforward. I would say this is one that you need to, have have just kind of like your answer to that you spiel a little bit um I also like with this question for you to say your name if we do a mock interview I'm probably going to tell you like hey introduce yourself again when you do this question um we want that connection we want the person interviewing you to remember your face remember your name if y'all have had any places that will ask you to submit a picture or take a picture of you at the interview. That's because when you come back up, when they're discussing everyone, after they've talked to a bunch of applicants, they want to remember who you are. So I think making those connections are good. Um, I also like one thing that stands out to me in interviews is when people can kind of subtly incorporate things about themselves in like the tell me about yourself question or throughout their interview, because you never know what is going to connect with your interviewer. Like if you happen to say like, I love to go on walks with my Pomeranian on the weekends, whatever. And then your interviewer's like, oh my gosh, I have a Pomeranian. Y'all instantly have this connection. You're going to be more memorable. Um, so those like little facts are are personal and will help you make a good impression. Um, can you say a fun or interesting fact about yourself during Tell Me Yourself? If it's appropriate, yeah. Um, I think that's totally fine. Um, I'll tell, I, I shouldn't say this, but I, I was at an interview um, and we, we had to stand up and like say a fun fact about ourselves. And this was so interesting. Um, Someone stood up and said that she was in a particular magazine that like has like fold outs and she was like the person chosen from her college. And we were all like, I can't believe you just said that at this interview. Um, yeah, I don't think she got it. I don't think she got into that school or at least not that year. But yeah, that was like an accomplishment that she wanted to share at the interview. So 
um, you know, something like, remember you are in a professional setting. So I would just keep that in mind when you're at the interview. Um, so I like Kayla's question here that I saw in the chat. I have problems. I have the problem of trying to think of answers that my answers are not good enough. They aren't grand enough or memorable enough, um, which caused me to circle. What do you remember? What do you recommend to try to avoid this trap? Okay, it is so common to feel like your answers aren't enough, like aren't good enough, aren't memorable, um, or to start rambling and just kind of lose the prompt, like get away from it. And you're like, oh yeah, what did they ask me? I don't really remember. I'm not sure where I was going with this. So a couple of things. It is fine to gather your thoughts. You can take a second when they ask you a question and just kind of breathe and gather your thoughts. Um, you can even say like, oh, give me a minute to think about that. It might feel super long to you, but it's not actually that long. So you can just kind of, yeah, gather your thoughts and then jump into your answer once you kind of organize things a little bit more. Um, but then just know that like your, your stories, your examples, it, it's all good enough. I see that with essays when people feel like their story is not unique enough. Um, see it with interviews, same thing. People just feel like it's not unique enough. And it is like, if you are being genuine, that will show, I can teach you to be confident. I can teach you to smile in your interview and appear more approachable, more friendly, more personable. Um, I cannot teach you to be genuine. And that's where you have to kind of break that shell away. Um, and, and that doesn't mean you're not being professional, but you are truly being yourself. Um, one way to do that, that I like to recommend that I kind of talk about with people in mock interviews is uh, pretending that you're talking to a patient. Uh, I feel like since I've been in clinical practice for so long, I recognize when I walk into a patient's room and y'all may relate to this if you have patient care experience. When I walk into a patient's room, one of my goals is to put them at ease. A lot of times it's a new person. We're strangers. I've never met them. They've never met me. We don't know anything about each other. Um, but I want them to have a good experience. So in doing that, I'm smiling. I have a good energy. Um, I'm walking in. I'm like, hey, how are you? You know, our little customer service voice kind of comes on. And I'm talking to the patient. And, and these patients, a lot of times, will ask me personal things. They'll say, like, are you from here? Or why did you want to be a PA? Or why didn't you go to med school? Uh, things like that. And, and so I'm answering these questions that often come up in interviews. And I know that the medical assistants I work with are too. They get asked all the time, like, what are you doing? Are you going to school? What What are, like, why are you with her? Um, and so if you think about how you would answer a patient, if they're just like, what is a PA? Why do you want to go to PA school? It may be a little bit different and a little bit less pressure than if you were answering that same question in an interview setting. Um, so as much as we are being professional and, you know, you may not feel at ease, if you can kind of get into that mindset of like, you're trying to put them at ease too, I think it just takes a little bit of that pressure off. Um, and just knowing that you do this every day, you come into contact with patients and people that you don't know, and you're just doing the same thing again. So it's just another way to think about it. Um, and then someone said, I saw a question... Um, I don't know where it went actually. Somebody asked about what to wear, like formal attire or flats. Okay. Flats are totally okay. Like go for comfort, hundred percent comfort. It, you want to feel, um, if you're choosing what to wear on interview day, you want to feel comfortable. You want to feel confident. I see in our Facebook group called the pre-PA club. Sometimes people will ask, you know, like, is this appropriate? Should I wear this? Uh, and my response is always, you know, if you feel comfortable, if you feel confident, wear it. If you're having to question it at all, if you're like, eh, is this appropriate? Should I wear this? Probably best to pass. If you're like, is this color okay? Is this too low? Are these heels too high? If you're questioning it, probably not the best choice. Um, but, you know, 
happy to crowdsource and, and give more opinions. Um, one thing I'll say about Zoom interviews, I think I saw a question somewhere about it. That's what I was looking for. But um, we're technically, you know, in a Zoom interview setting. So there are a few things if you're doing a virtual interview to keep in mind. Um, you want a background that is uh, neutral, for lack of a better term. Uh, we don't want any like weird pictures in the background, any questionable books uh, that could bring up questions. Um, again, this background is super boring. Um, I feel like anywhere in my room would be okay. Like I have this bookshelf, like that'd probably be fine. But like the light over here is not great. So I don't know that I would do that. Um, because that might be weird. But then like, if I go this way, I have really good like natural light. So maybe that would be a good way to sit. Um, but yeah, natural light is great for interviews. Uh, we want kind of a neutral background. You want something comfortable. So you want to, you know, I would still dress professional, wear your suit. I always recommend a suit uh, regardless of anything, like wear a suit. But if we're sitting here, um, like just a few minutes ago, I was kind of like sitting back like this. I would not sit like this in an interview, whether I was virtual or in person. If I'm in an interview, I am going to be sitting up tall. I'm going to have my back straight. Um, I tend to slouch a lot, but in this setting, I'm going to have my back up straight. I'm going to have my feet on the ground. Um, I know that I like, you know, move my hands around a lot. Uh, so I'm going to probably have my hands clasped, clasped in my lap. Um, and I am going to try to be engaged whether I'm in person or not. So that means I'm sitting like up kind of forward. I'm going to be smiling. I'm going to be happy uh, during my interview. Even if I'm sweating, even if I'm shaking, I'm going to try to fake it until I make it uh, and act like I'm not. Uh, so um, one thing that kind of gets a little bit weird with virtual interviews is where you're looking. So like right now I'm looking at my camera and I have this the video thing like up close to the top of the screen because we tend to look at ourselves. Um, so I don't know if you can tell like right now I'm looking at myself. I'll move it down here. So I'm like looking at myself and then if I move it up here, I'm looking at my camera. Um, so that's something else that you can kind of practice and play with and see what you feel most comfortable with so that hopefully, you know, that's not distracting to you on interview day. Um, people are saying, what about a dress or a skirt? What's the equivalent of a suit for a woman? Um, I still recommend a pants suit for women. <laughs> Let me tell you why. So when I was applying to PA school, somehow I think I called up the school and I just happened to talk to the director of the program. And uh, I was asking something about admissions and I realized like who it was. And so we were able to talk for a couple of minutes and she was very kind to do that. Her name was Dr. Dating. And I said, you know, I'm still in college. Is there anything you recommend me to do for interviews that I see out? And she said, and it has stuck with me. She was like, I'm looking for maturity. And so the biggest thing against you is that you're young. And she said, I would try to make yourself look older. And she said, I recommend everyone wear a pantsuit, even women. And so I think she said something along the lines of like, it like differentiate it's like one less thing to differentiate you from like male applicants I don't know um again later in this process when I was in PA school and helping with interviews um someone told me basically they're like a qualified male applicant is more likely to get in than a qualified female applicant because there are less of them so like in my program we had a fourth were males and the rest were out of 44 uh, were females. Um, and so, you know, schools want like equal classes if they can, but they also want the best applicants. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and I think I just personally would have been more uncomfortable in a skirt suit. So I wore like a gray, it was kind of like a light gray pants suit. I wish I still had it. Um, it had like a slight pinstripe to it. And then I wore a um like a dark plum colored lace like shell top underneath um is it okay to have a pop of color when wearing a pantsuit or should I wear neutral colors yeah I think I think do a pop of color in like your shirt um you know subtle jewelry is totally fine maybe not a crazy shoe or anything 
Um, some of these suits I'm seeing, like they make suits in every single color these days now. Um, and I just, my thing with that is just keep in mind that your interviewers may be more uh, old school. Um, and so they may not be as receptive to some of these colors. And then also like if you're interviewing in the fall or winter and you show up in a white or light pink suit, like it's kind of like off season. Um, so it may look like, did you like not prepare or like, did you not think about what interviews were? I don't know. Um, so just kind of keep those things in mind too. And again, just like comfort is so important. Um, and then piercings, I would try to look at the school's website and see if they have a handbook. If you're concerned about piercings or tattoos, um, like our school did not allow piercings or tattoos, and that was already on the school website beforehand. And so you could see that. And so like I knew a couple of people who had to take their piercings out for the interviews. And then um, we had a classmate who he actually had full sleeves of tattoos on both arms. And I did not know the whole time we were in school. I ran into him during our second year at clinical year um, at the beach, like out of town. And he came up and I did not even recognize him. And I was like, you have tattoos? And he was like, yeah, I have to keep them covered for school. And so I, was, yeah, I just thought he was cold. I thought that's why he wore like long sleeves with scrubs and outfits every day. But um, no, he just had tattoos he couldn't show. Um, and then, yeah, like, like ear piercings, I wouldn't worry about that. Just don't wear anything like crazy or flashy. Okay, let's see. Oh, someone said they're interested in the phlebotomy program and how that works. Um, so we can probably get you more info about that, but I would just go to the advanced um, eClinical training website. And I've if you go to the Facebook group, people talk about the programs all the time. We hear really great things. Um, so they'll do the online class and then I think you can take the exam. And I think y'all like place them for clinical stuff too. Um, there's like medical assistant, all kinds of options there. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So advancedclinical.org. Savannah, I just want to do a quick time check. We are okay. at um, 549, we have up until about six o'clock. We'll okay. try to get as many questions as we can. And, and I'm happy to work with Savannah to do another webinar to cover any questions we don't cover today. Yeah, y'all let us know what would be helpful. I know there are some questions about MMI and different things. I'm going to see if I can rapid fire some of these um, and focus on the PA school one. Okay, so we covered a lot of these. Let me go to like some of the more recent ones then. Okay, so I'm seeing some questions about, it seems like we want to cover like why PA um, and what is a PA and how to make sure those are covered. So if you're, well, okay. One point I want to make or make sure I make before we're done. Um, I want to make sure that you go into your interview like I said like knowing what you want to talk about but also knowing that you may not be asked every single question you prepare for so you need to be able to take your answers and your stories and kind of make them fit for different questions because it is important to show that you know what a PA is and what a PA does but you may not be directly asked that question so if you are asked or you're given the opportunity to talk about it, this is a great chance to bring up shadowing experiences with PAs and to bring up any work experiences directly with PAs as backup, as proof that you have this experience and truly understand what a PA is. So let's say you're asked about it. You need to have a definition of what a PA does. So a PA is a medical provider who works in many different settings and specialties um, and can move around between different specialties who 
evaluates patients, diagnoses them, coming up, comes up with treatment plans, orders labs and imaging and interprets those, um, can perform procedures, can assist in surgeries, um, can prescribe medicine, and can really take care of the entire patient. Um, the important things to me to differentiate are prescribing medicine. Um, that's something that not all healthcare professionals can do. And then I think you need to make sure you show that teamwork aspect of being a PA and working with physicians um, in different relationships, whether that's very closely or um, sometimes not as closely. And so that's where then being able to say, you know, I saw this while I was shadowing. Um, and maybe, you know, I shadowed Morgan in a dermatology office and I watched her see 35 patients during the day. Um, she was pretty autonomous in seeing them, but there were a couple of cases where she wasn't sure about the best way to do a procedure. And so she consulted with the physician and they made a decision together. Um, and the physician, you know, popped her head in and looked at the patient and they went about it together to make sure that the patient got the best care possible. You know, being able to really, um, we, we want to think about showing and not just telling. And so anyone can look up what a PA is and what a PA does, but those personal experiences, and even as a patient, you could, you could pull in your own experiences as a patient um, and talk about those as well. And then um, as far as PA versus NP, MD, all of that, that is something that you don't necessarily have to include if it's not part of your story. Um, so I do think a lot of people that want to become PAs were pre-med or considered medical school before choosing PA, but I don't necessarily think that everyone was considering nursing before they decide to go to PA school. Um, like for me, those are kind of different tracks. I was already getting a biology major. Um, it wouldn't have made sense for me to switch to nursing. So that just really wasn't a path I kind of went down. Um, whereas I was considering med school. And so being able to say, you know, for me, and this is going to be your personal answer, um, I felt a lot of anxiety about choosing a specialty early on and the testing involved with that. Um, but once I found PA, I felt much more at peace with kind of the path and the decision and knowing that I didn't have to decide right away what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I backed that up with shadowing and I shadowed a PA and a doctor. And between the two, I found that my personality and my goals fit best with the PA. I was ready to work. I was ready to get out there. Um, she was young. She was already seeing patients taking care of them. And um, I really, really liked the teamwork aspect I saw of how she collaborated with the doctor. They would round together um, and then they would see patients separately. They would come back together and kind of discuss things. And I felt like that made patient care better. And I wanted to be a part of that. Um, so, you know, I, that's my answer. And I think you really may have to spend some time reflecting and doing some soul searching to figure out what exactly that is at this point we've you know been down this path for so long you need some reflection like you need to go back and think about where you started um think about again getting a little bit visual like the the forks in the road at what what were your pivotal moments that's something i talk about a lot um what were your pivotal moments what were the things that pushed you towards PA or maybe away from it and then back towards it. Um, what were those? Like for me, it was my sister had a lot of medical issues growing up. So that kind of pushed me towards medicine. And then I found out what the PA profession was, but I still wasn't sure about it. Um, then I became a biology major and was still kind of searching. And then I did shadowing and that really pushed me towards PA. And then I became a CNA um, and that pushed me towards PA. And also I just want to say, I'm very thankful that um, advanced clinical has these online options for you guys. Now, when I was in college, I had to drive an hour and a half each way or like there and back, uh, every Saturday for three months to get my CNA license. It was miserable. Like that was not fun to do while I was in college. And then I had to do clinicals during spring break. Um, so I would have absolutely loved an online option. <laughs> it's so much easier, but um, you know, that was just something I talked about. And like, I was so committed to this that that's what I did. 
And so you can, can really think about those things that have gotten you here that maybe you've forgotten about, or, um, you know, we, we kind of, it's harder to look back. So I would spend some time kind of reflecting on what has helped you to make your decisions. All right. And we have a couple more minutes to fit some in. Uh, Okay, so we haven't talked about this at all. This is going to advice for reapplicants. Um, if you received interviews, um, I would, and and even if you didn't, um, you can probably expect to be asked maybe about what you've done, or if you're even if you're not asked, I would still expect that you expand on what you've done since the last cycle. So, what have you done to get more experience? To um, learn more about the PA profession to make your application more well-rounded. Uh, what parts of it have you improved? Uh, how do you feel more prepared, more mature? Really go into all of those details. Um, so those are some things that you can kind of prepare and think about ahead of time. So that when you get to the interview, you can share them with, with them at the interview. Um, does hair have to be up or down and nails? I put my hair up because again, I mess with it and thought it was going to be a distraction for me, but I don't think it really matters. Nails, I would do something, you know, neutral, nothing too long, nothing too crazy. Um, I have Taylor Swift nails right now because I went to see Taylor Swift. Uh, so I would not do black sparkly nails for my interview. Clearly not those, but yeah, just something nice and neutral. Okay, we'll do this last one because it's a short one. Thoughts on saying collaborating physician versus supervising physician. Um, the most accepted terminology right now for essays, for interviews, for everything is collaborating physician. Uh, so that's what we're going to use is collaborating instead of supervising because a lot of times like a, a doctor is not ever really directly supervising me. Uh, she may, we may collaborate. We talk about patients a lot. Um, and we'll talk about care and plans and all kinds of stuff, but we, she's not really ever like supervising me at this point. So collaborating is what you'd want to use. All right. We got a lot answered, but I know there are some that we didn't. Um, y'all can always email me to, uh, find me. Somebody said on TikTok, I'm physician assistant on there and the PA platform pretty much everywhere else. So if there are any questions, please let me know. And good luck on y'all's interviews. I know a lot of people said y'all have interviews, so good luck on those. Thank you so much, Savannah. I learned a lot, and hopefully folks on the call learned a lot as well. I am putting my information in the chat if you have any questions. As a reminder, a recording will be emailed to everyone on this call about an hour from now. So if you don't get your recording, feel free to send me an email and I'll resend it. And if you do choose to sign up for any of our certification programs, please use webinar 400 at checkout for $400 off any of our um, certifications. Thank you all so much for joining again and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Savannah. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.